announcements, so we'll go through these quickly. First of all, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the house, all the grandmothers. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being here with us to worship. A couple of things. Also Monday, uh, 6.45 a.m., youth prayer breakfast in the Anchor. Uh, Tuesday, 9 a.m., uh, begin preparations for the sports banquet, which will be that evening uh, at 6.30. Uh, no desserts are needed, so you do not need to bring desserts for uh, the banquet that's provided. Uh, also Thursday, uh, prime timers leave for Murray's Dinner Theater at 5.15. Friday, 11.30, prime timers potluck luncheon hamburgers uh, will be provided, but please bring the trimmings uh, for those. Uh, Saturday, 7 a.m., set up for block party at Bill Nick Fireman's Park. And then from 8 to 12 will be the BB Cleanup Day block party. And uh, it's going to be a fun day of excitement and a lot of activities. And then on Sunday at 5 o'clock, our youth committee will be meeting. Uh, we'll be meeting in the gathering at 5 o'clock on Sunday. 6 o'clock, Children's Spring Musical. And then Terrytown meeting will be after the musical. A very important meeting for those that are planning to go to Terrytown. Uh, please be here for that meeting. Also, May 14th from 4 to 8 p.m., there's a police uh, fundraiser for Patrolman Bradley West, uh, catered by Gus's Fried Chicken. The cost is donation. Uh, my understanding is the need is $48,000, so anything you could do to help out with that would be much appreciated. American Legion Hut. American Legion Hut. I have no idea where that's at. Down to, okay. Um, then uh, also the FBC's Got Talent fundraiser. Uh, we're going to have that on the 23rd. It's going to be a fun night. We're going to have hamburgers over in the anchor. Uh, and then we're going to come over here and have our talent show. It's going to be fun. It's going to be music. It won't be just music. Uh, there's going to be quite a bit of humor involved uh, that night. So it's going to be a fun night as well. And uh, donations for that. Is, we're suggested donation of $10 for adults and 5 for children. And then also Celebrate Recovery is going to have a fundraiser luncheon on June 3rd uh, also. So again, thank you so much for being here. Let's worship the Lord again. The American Legion HUD, if you'll go to City Hall and look across the street, you'll see it. Okay? So if you want, if you want to participate in that, we, we'd be appreciative to help a fellow a, a, a police officer in our community. Uh, also want to remind you that Andy will be playing in a golf tournament raising funds for Options Women's Pregnancy Center. He'll be out in the hallway today. If you'd like to make a contribution, you can do that online. If you have any more information, we say that we believe in saving lives, so this gives an opportunity for us to help save lives. For the last several years, our church, through you, have been the biggest fundraiser for that, the big, big, raised the most money of the person's playing, so we surely want to put our money where our mouth is many times, and we want to say thank you to the Lord for for what he's allowed us to be a part of. Would you stand with me, please, as we begin our service with a moment of silence. You praying for people around the world, our police officers, our military personnel, our firefighters, our EMTs, as well as our military. Bow with me in prayer. Father, we want to say thank you today for your sovereign care over us. We want to say thank you today for the opportunity and privilege that we have to be in your house. We want to worship you as the King of kings and Lord of lords, for indeed you are. No doubt today there are people in our congregation who have questions. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them to see today that you have all the answers. I pray for our military personnel, for our firefighters, for our EMTs. Uh, I, I pray for our police officers that, Lord, your hand of protection would be upon them. And I pray that in this service that you would speak to our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated as Brother Nick comes to begin to lead us. And thank you, Lord. I've got a special emphasis that I want to say today to our church that know her. Cheyenne is in service today. So, so we want to be sure that if you have the opportunity, you come hug her neck while we're singing this song. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make you think, if you're visiting us with us for the very first time, that you're not important. We are indeed thankful that you are here today. Uh, we want you to have a genuine, meaningful worship experience. Cheyenne had a wreck about two years ago, 
and uh, today's the first time she's been able to be back in our service, and we just want to say a special welcome, special thank you, and God has worked a marvelous work, and to him we give him all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Men, please make your way down the aisles. If we do have a guest, please uh, allow one of these gentlemen to give you a guest card. We are indeed thankful that you're here with us. Uh, join in with us as we worship today. We're excited about this opportunity. Stand and let's welcome one another. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for how you've worked in the life of Cheyenne. Just a joy to be able to see her sitting in our congregation again. So, Lord, we prayed for her for two years now. And, Lord, we see that you have wrought a wonderful work, and we give you praise. Thank you for our folks that have gathered around her and expressed uh, just joy of seeing her today. And I pray that you'd continue to bring forth a complete and total healing for her, and that you'd continue to glorify yourself through her and her family. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Saying, just get ready. Everybody didn't get to hug you, so at the end of the service, we're going to bring you forward. We're going to let people hug your neck, okay? It is indeed good seeing you today. It's a joy to be here. Well, this is a special day. 
Uh, I always love Mother's Day if there's anybody in my opinion, and that's what counts today because I get the opportunity to speak, that deserves a holiday in their honor is our mothers. It's a wonderful day. I read an article this past week of what not to do at Mother's Day, and this particular gentleman said that we should not have them stand and we should not recognize them. So I'm going to break all rules today. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded that, you know, as we have Mother's Day, not only is it a day of rejoicing for every one of us, it's also a sad day. I understand that, that in some of our hearts there's an element of tear, uh, joy and tears at the same time, and that many of us, our mothers, are no longer with us. And by no means are we, as we honor our mothers, are expressing any kind of sadness. Uh, but I want to have a time, as we've always had since I've been here, uh, that if your mother is no longer with you, if she, if she has passed away, I want to ask that you would just stand in remembrance of her today. And as we stand, that's many, many of the people in the congregation, we are indeed thankful for our moms, and I want you to know, as a fellow struggler with you that I pray for you regularly because our moms may not be here with us in person but you know as well as I they've made a lasting impression upon our lives forever on the earth amen thank you, you may be seated um, what we want to do today as well we want to honor all of our mothers that are in the congregation today Got a couple of special gifts. Some have, have their pictures made earlier today between before Sunday school and after Sunday school. We're thankful for uh, Bruce Allen. I'm sorry for the brain block. Thankful for Bruce Allen for setting up and taking pictures of the moms and their kids. Thank you, Bruce, for that, and we surely appreciate that. But we also got a gift that we want you to receive one, even if you've already got one. So we want all of our mothers in the congregation to stand, please. All of our mothers stand. And we've got, we produce, our congregation has produced some cookbooks. We're going to give those out to you today. Not, not to say that you need to start cooking. But if you are in the, if you cook, go ahead and use it. If you've already got one, please go ahead and take one, pass it on, gift it to someone else. Oh, Adam, we've got, we've got a couple up here. Make sure, make sure these at the, in the, uh, up here on the stage need a cookbook as well. We want to say, ladies, as you receive one, please sit down so that we will know that we pass those out. Um, Y'all need some help getting those books to you, fellas? <laughs> Adam, as we get through passing these out, I want to make sure that you go down to Children's Church and Nursery and make sure all of our mothers there. If you can hear me in uh, uh, Nursery, we are thankful for you as well. Thank you for taking care of our kids and grandkids and being faithful in your attendance there. Again, moms, we're getting to you. We've got one more over here. Indeed, thank you, mothers, for the contribution that you have made in our lives. Obviously, without you, we would not be here. You've, sh you've helped shape us and make us into the men and women that I believe that God would have for us to be, so we are extremely thankful for you. Last week, Keith LaCrosse filled in for Irvin Carter because Irvin was on drill duty through the National Guard for this week. Irvin's going to come to the podium at this time and lead us to the Lord in prayer. But ushers, would you come back to do double duty to, uh, to receive our offering today? Brother Irvin. Would you pray with me, please? 
Father, we just thank you for such a, a beautiful, beautiful day to just gather together in your house and worship and honor and just show you that we love you, Father. We thank you today for mothers. We thank you for the mothers that are with us, and we especially thank you for our mothers that are with you. Father, we just we thank you for their influences they've had on our lives, Lord, and we just pray that you'd be with us today, Lord, and just bless this offering we're about to receive, and may you use it to further your kingdom. Father, just bless the giver and bless those fathers that can't give. Lord, we just thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the Master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty your love has wrought. God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes. Homes where the Father is true and strong. Homes that are free from the blight of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the Mother in care Strives to show others your way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so. Homes where the altar fires burn and glow. 
God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Serve the Lord with gladness in our works and ways. Come before His presence with our songs of praise. Unto Him, our Maker, we would pledge a new life's supreme devotion to serve as true. Serve Him with gladness, enter His courts with song. Belong. Great is His mercy, wonderful is His name. We gladly serve Him, His great love proclaim. Serve the Lord with gladness, thankful all the while. For His tender mercy, for His loving smile. just the same. We will serve with gladness and praise His name. Serve Him with gladness, enter His courts with song. To our Creator, true praises belong. Great is His mercy, wonderful
thought that you would laugh and maybe I knew that I would cry You invested everything without any guarantee Tried your best to raise me right Praying one day that you'd see it was worth it all You didn't waste your time and Everything that you went through For this life that I call mine And you were always there To pick me up when I would fall I hope that you can say it was worth it all me how to live and love and if I had the things I needed well I had more than enough but the greatest gift you ever gave is the one thing I'm specially thankful for you taught me about Jesus and now I can say for sure that it was worth it all. You didn't waste your time and everything that you went through for this life that I call mine. And you were always there to pick me up when I would fall. I hope that you can say it was worth it. Finally fly away I want to leave behind a legacy And I hope my children say That it was worth it all You didn't waste your time And everything that you went through For this life that I I'm, I'm thankful that mama didn't kill me when I was being raised. I probably should have been, being the runt of the bunch. And I know that I put her through a lot of heartache. But I just hope the things I do and the things I say today is pleasing to her. But more importantly, I hope the things that I say and do today pleases the Lord. This past week, Josh called me. For those of you who do not know, Josh is our oldest son. Pastor's First Baptist Church of West Memphis began to be the pastor last July. He said, Dad, I'm struggling. I said, well, son, he... I'm, I'm not only his dad, but I'm his pastor. You understand? He said, Dad, I'm struggling with this Mother's Day deal. I said, you know, I, I just, it's, it's difficult. 
to find the sermon for Mother's Day. Oh, well, son, take it. Take some good words of advice. I'm not a real good counselor. But son, take good words of advice. Wait till you've been to the same place for 24 years and try to preach 24 different Mother's Day sermons. I don't know if that brought much counsel to him. This, this, this today is a Mother's Day sermon that I believe that God has laid on my heart and perhaps will be somewhat different. But, but I believe with all of my heart that this is the message that God wants each of you, each of us to hear today. Listen closely. There is not a person in our congregation today that, that does not need to hear the message that I believe that God has laid upon your pastor's heart. How many of you mothers and dads have raised kids who were inquisitive? That is, they had a lot of questions. Through life you had questions of perhaps even the most often questions, but why? No, no, what about your answer was, I'll tell you what mama said, because I said so. I don't, have to, I don't have to explain it to you, boy. And maybe sometimes she did not explain it to you. And sometimes we may ask God questions as to why. And to be honest with you, I'm thankful that God does not always answer that question. Because I don't really know if you and I could handle the why answer from God. With that in mind, I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, begin reading with verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? That, that is the very first question in this text. There's five questions, and that is the very first one, but we're going to wait till last to answer that. Pastor, why do you take it out of context and answer this question last? Well, give me just about 20 to 25 minutes and I believe that you will see why. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, here's the next question, who will be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, here's the third question, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Here's the next one, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. Verse 34 is the next. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died and, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Here's the next one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or prayer or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of a mother is hard to equal. I mean, as we grow in life, we, we have a love for our mother, we have a love for our brothers and sisters. If we're fortunate enough to find someone to take us in marriage, we have a husband or a wife that, that will love us, and they love us unconditionally. If we're blessed with children, our children bless us. And there's all different types of love. But, but perhaps we might, we might say that, that, the, that the love of a mother is unparalleled. until we grip the love of God. Until we understand the depth and the height and the width, the breadth of how much God loves us. And in this passage of Scripture, I believe he's bringing us to that very final question, but, but he, he, he brings us in this passage of Scripture to the very vital questions of life. The, the very first one that I want us to look at today that's in your outline is in verse 31. If God is for us, here's the question, who can be against us? 
I've said it over and over again. I don't want to confuse you, but the Greek language, the original language of the Bible, is a, is a very descriptive language. It's, it's a whole lot more descriptive than what we are today. And the, this, this, this uh, particle if, it, 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 it does not provide for a supposition, but for a certainty. It is not a condition, but it is a conclusion. Properly understood, th this word could be translated in one of four ways, and this way it's properly understood since God is with us. We, 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 we say it the same way. Perhaps we, we've got a trial, we've got a tribulation, we've got something that we face, and, and our kids say, Dad, if you will go with me, I'll go. And in reality, what are you saying is since. Since God is with us, and, and the first thing that we've got to understand as believers, that, that wherever we go and whatever we do, aren't you thankful that God is with us? Since God is with us, who can be against us? Some people, not only mostly outside of the church, but inside of the church have, have the idea sometimes maybe we're going through different trials or tribulations in life. We have, we have an idea that maybe God is against us. We have er erroneously thought that, that God is just sitting around, around waiting for us to make a mistake so that he can bring forth judgment and wrath. Many, probably all at one point in our lives, have blamed God for bad things that happened. God, if you're so good, God, if you're so powerful, God, if you're so loving, then why did you allow this to happen to me? Why does bad things happen to good people? Well, let me answer you that question, scripturally speaking. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be rude. But the scripture says there's none good, no, not one. Bad things happen to those of us who are followers of Christ. We have, we have somehow, some people have, have the idea that so, so many times in life we've got to do something good so that we can uh, seek the approval of God. That is, I have to persuade God to love me. I'm thankful that I've not had to persuade God to love me. Because I can tell you for sure, my persuading what wouldn't I've not done very good. Sometimes we have had the idea that God loves, listen closely, that God loves the good boys and that God hates the bad boys. It's almost out like we have the idea about God that some people have about Santa Claus. But he's making a list, he's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. And those that are nice get things good, and those that are naughty receive the judgment of God. If this is your thinking, let me share with you that this is not biblical thinking. Well, what we need to do is allow the Word of God. When, when we begin to think that maybe something is happening in our life that, that, that deletes us or, or, or takes us away from the love of God, let me remind you to look at the cross. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, the Scripture says, But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God. While some of us may be shaking our fist at God, saying, God, why have you allowed this to happen? Why, why me, God? Why, but, but, but we need to understand that, that, that God loves us, even in this, this, this spirit of, of uh, enmity between us and God. God still loves us. I remind you of 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, and this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him, here in His love. Not that we love God, but that He first loved us. And He sent His Son to be, to be the propitiation for our sins. Goes on further in the book of John to say, First John to say, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. How can we talk about the love of God without mentioning John 3.16, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you look in verse 32, Paul tells us that if God spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more shall he not freely give us all things? So the first question that we find is in verse 31, the statement, since God is for us, who can be against us? Listen closely. Whatever you're going through in life, whatever situation you may find yourself in, and maybe you, and you're, humanly speaking, you can't comprehend it and you can't figure it out, let me let you know for sure that the Scripture says that God is for you. The whole world may turn against you, but God's on your side. Second question. Number one, verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Secondly, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? What is going on to bring charges? Uh, who is going to bring charges against you? Not God. God has justified us. That is, he has declared us innocent. God has brought us play to that place through repentance and faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can live a life of innocence. In fact, if you look back in Romans chapter one, chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And then if you place this in context in verses 22 and 26 and 28, he's talking about things that we know. We know that God is for us. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who then is bringing charge against you? It's not God. And if it's not God, the answer must be Satan. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, And I heard a voice saying, and I heard a voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which is accused before them day and night. In the book of Job, we find the Satan acting in this capacity when he began to come in Job chapter, chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, when he began to accuse Job before God. Let me ask you a question. As far as I can tell, make a statement and ask a question. As far as I can tell, this is the only personal accusation that he had made in Scripture against an individual. Do you think that Job is the only one that Satan ever accused before God? Do, do you think that maybe in our lives that, that, that maybe the Satan has come to God in heaven and say, God, the only reason Bob is, is serving you is because you've been so good to Bob. And I tell you what, to God be the glory. God's been good to me. Amen. God's been good to all of us. But could it be that it was not only Job? In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11 now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going forth to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and excueth or hateth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? Hast, not, hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thine hand and touch all that he has and he will curse thee to thy face. You read the book of Job. Amen? You know that through it all, Job remained faithful. He may have had questions, he may have, have doubts. But, but through it all, God is going to be faithful. And many times our enemies may lay charges against us, maybe even sometimes our friend. But God in heaven is not laying charges against us. In fact, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the man and to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Do you get it? Number one. If God is for us, since God is for us, who can be against us? Number two, who shall lay anything against the, uh, lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Number three, and you're out loud, who is he that condemneth? You see, Jesus Christ does not condemn. The scripture says in the gospel of John that we are condemned already. 
Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He told him that God did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He said that those who believe in him were not condemned, but whoever did not believe were condemned already. already. You see, all mankind, from Adam to this day, the Scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when someone condemns you, and someone has perhaps condemned us all, don't take that as a word from God. But take that as a word from the enemy. When they brought the woman and the woman taken in adultery to Jesus, wanting to stone her, Jesus told them that whosoever was without sin, let them cast the first stone. Then Jesus, at least to me, did an unusual thing. He bowed down, knelt down on the ground, and he began to walk. Excuse me. He began to write in the dirt. Speculation is, of many commentators that I've read, speculation is this. He began to write the names of the men who had visited the prostitute. And when he wrote down their names, they just tucked their heads and began to walk away. And all of a sudden, everybody laughed. And Jesus looked at this woman and said, Where are your accusers? She responded, not in King James Version, but in Bob Hall translation, I don't guess I have any. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Listen, go and sin no more. All of us, every single one of us here, have done things in life that we would want to condemn ourselves. God's not condemning us. He wants us to focus on who He is and what He has done. He, he, he constantly telling us, or Satan is constant, constantly telling us that we do not deserve to be saved. And when Satan tells me that I don't deserve to be saved, this is what I say. You're exactly correct. I don't deserve it, but it's not come upon my merit. But it's come upon, it came, come, came about because of a personal relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. You see, the problem is Satan can often build a strong case against every one of us. Amen? But I got good news. God's case is stronger. He died that we might have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit brings forth conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit draws us to salvation. The Holy Spirit reveals to us that we're a sinner and that we need to be saved. And we bow before a holy God and we say to God, God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Forgive me my sin. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And he makes a brand new person of us. Number one, if God be for us, who can be against us? Number two, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Number three, who is he that condemneth? Number four, who shall separate us, in verse 35 through 39, from the love of Christ? I have seen broken homes. I have seen few, but I have seen some moms and children come apart. I am so extremely thankful to, to mom's very last breath. She loved me. Mother had COPD. The last two years, at least of her life, she suffered quite a bit. In fact, doctors tell, uh, told us that uh, oftentimes mother would just really light in to my next to the oldest brother and oldest sister and youngest sister. She had, she had lied into them. She had just, she would, she, she had my next to the oldest brother at one time that I would consider a man's man. She had him weeping in tears. In fact, they called me, one, one, of, the, one of our neighbors called me and said, Bob, I don't know what you're doing, but you need to get to the hospital right now. Your mother's got James in tears. Your mother's got Faye in tears. Your mother's got Judy in tears. Your mother is just, it, it, they were saying because of the oxygen level, she, she was just saying things normally that she would not say. So I got on my phone, called the church, said I'm headed to 
Oak Hill, Arkansas, to the hospital. I walked in the hospital room, and there sat James and Faye and Judy and Dr. Cullum, our general practitioner that had been our doctor for years. I walked in, and Mama sat up in bed, a smile on come on her face, and she said, well, there's Bob. <laughs> Faye and James and Judy and Dr. Cullum went. She bought all the nurses out. God protected me. I'd be honest with you. I, I, don't, I don't know if I could have handled it. Had she said the same thing to me that she had said to them, I don't know if I could have handled it. God's been my, I say all that to say this. Nothing can separate us from the love of our mother. Shouldn't. But even for those broken homes, we understand that nothing separates us from the love of God. I want you to look at these verses closely in verses 35 through 39. He, he, he first of all mentions a list of things. When he says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sore? Things. How many times we allow things to get in our way? I don't have the car that I'd like to have, or I don't have the house that another believer has. This very thing, how, shall, how, how come they have it and I don't? So, so he first mentions a list of things. And he says, in all of these things, listen, we are more than conquerors. But it, it, you, don't, you don't have to lift your hands, but there might be some wrestling fans. And this really is a wrestling term. And he has the idea that, that, that Jesus is, is used over in Revelation chapter 1 as well. It has Jesus has Satan on the mat, and Jesus has his foot on the throat of Satan. He has overcome Satan. How shall we overcome them? By the word of our mouth, by the, by, by, by the word of our testimony. And when we love not our life unto death, don't allow things. Not only does he mention a list of things, but secondly, he lists a group of entities. Shall death, or life, or angels, or principalities, or power, present things, future things, height, nor death, nor any other created thing. Don't let anything separate us. There is nothing. I don't care what you have done. I don't care how low that you have gotten in life. Jesus still loves you. Which brings us to the fifth. That's really going to bring us back to the first. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he has called you? There it is in your outline. He, God loves you. He has called you. He has justified you. And he has glorified you. Uh, imagine salvation where we have a God that has called us and justified us and glorified us. You see, Jesus died for us. Jesus rose again. He's at the right hand of the Father ever living to make intercession for us. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in you to help you to overcome your areas of weakness and the divine trinity is on your team. How can you lose? You can't. I was in the ninth grade. We was playing the Wilson Bulldogs. We were behind 32 to 6. I never will forget. Two minutes left to go in the game. And our cheerleaders began to cheer something like this. I don't remember all the cheer. But this is all I remember them saying, are the Bulldogs going to win tonight? No, they not. Who going to win? They begin to spell the Eagles. And I'm beginning to think, I'm out there on the field, and I begin to think, we're 32 to 6. There's two minutes left to go in the game. You girls sure are pretty, but you mighty dumb. That might have been the reason we was behind 32 to 6 that I had my eyes on the girls rather than on the football game. But there might be times in our life that we feel like that we're behind 32 to 6, and, and that there's only two minutes left to go in the game. How can we win? I don't know how, but listen, this I know, I will. We didn't beat the Bulldogs, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, we beat the devil. Amen?
So, so going back to the first question, what shall we say to these things? Well, the things that he's talking about, particularly I think is in chapter 8, uh, that we are free from indwelling sin, that we have the Holy Spirit living within us, the Holy Spirit guiding us, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, correcting us, the, the Holy Spirit being with us, the, the, the Holy Spirit, we are now sons of God. Notice what he says. Look with me in verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I'm not for sure if any of us here today really know what sufferings are. I receive about a daily message from our interpreter in Nicaragua, Mike. It's almost unconscionable what's going on in Nicaragua at this time. If some of the people that are marching, if the police officers are around and they don't like what they're doing, they just shoot them. Get rid of them. Mike, I think, is trying to stay faithful to the cause of Christ, though he has lost every form of income because of what's going on. He was an interpreter for four Christian groups. All four have ceased all mission trips for the summer. He was a tour guide, particularly for the volcanoes there in, in Managua and Leon and, and the places that, that he took to pay. He, 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 and, 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 and all tourism has stopped. But he's trying to maintain faithfulness. I write, Mike, how are you going to survive? His answer is God will provide. I suppose that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. And I realize some of our suffering has been deep. The loss of a mom or dad or son or daughter, someone close to you, that's almost an inexplicable pain. You, you know, my dad was the first one to die of my parents. And I, this is my own conviction. It's not that I love daddy more than I love mother. I was a mother's boy, also a daddy's boy. But uh, w when he died, for, for a brief moment of time, I got mad, and I got mad at God. God, why did you allow my daddy to die so early? He's only... 72 years of age. And there's some wicked men in Dice, Arkansas. I'm talking about some wicked men. Why couldn't those wicked men die? And my good daddy not die. And at the same time that I'm going through those moments of grief and heartache, the Spirit of God was unexplainably present. When we were in Nicaragua, and they start throwing the blocks or rocks or whatever they were at the bus. I'm telling you what, your preacher was scared. And I had five other men and one lady that I think was scared as well. Our bus driver and all were scared. But at the same time that there was that fear, there was the overwhelming peace of God that God said, I've got it. I don't know about you in life. I believe that I can speak for every one of us. I'm thankful that God's got it. I'm thankful that through persecution and death, whatever comes my way, there may be difficult days, there may be days of heartaches, but this I know. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And nothing, can separate me from the love of God. Death has separated me for the last eight years, the last ten years from my mom. Love has not changed, but it's separated me. 
this relationship that I have with Jesus Christ will be forever and forever and forever. Amen. Nothing. So whatever you're going through today, you don't have to take the words of the pastor. Take the words of the Bible. Nothing shall separate you from the love of Christ. Would you stand with me, please? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and privilege that we have to gather in your house, set under the proclamation of your word. No doubt, Lord, there's men and women, boys and girls, going through trials and troubles and tribulations at this time. I pray that you would have used the word of God today to bring forth comfort and peace, minister to their hearts personally, particularly in the needs that they have. Glorify yourself in this invitation by helping us to do what we'd be glad that we've done throughout all eternity, receiving you as Lord and Savior of our lives and serving you faithfully. For we pray in Jesus' name. Just a second, Cheyenne. How do you unlock this thing? Is it